Um, this is Andy and Joanne, Lord, that, that they are from North Georgia. And so we're just so grateful that they got to come and be a part of what we're doing today. And they're going to, they're going to share a story of their life, something that happened in their life, just, just traumatizing. And we've all had these kind of things happen in our life. But what the story today, we're going to talk about that, but we're also going to talk about how they went from the dark place and how God brought them to the light place, where they are today, what they're doing today, how they're moving today. So thank you. So let's just sit down. This is our life talk. We call this our life talk, the LOL life talk. I'm sorry, Shelly, you're so far away over there. I guess I could have moved it further. But um, so... (laughs) So this is just like a casual setting. So just sit back, relax, grab something to drink if there is anything left, and um, just enjoy because, listen, if you've had any kind of trauma in your life, this is, going to, this is going to help you. This is going to help you come out of that into a better place, into a, a place of light, a place of comfort, a place of healing. And so we're all about healing here. We're all about seeing what God wants to do, how he's going to move in our lives, each one of us. Each one of us have different circumstances, different things that we go through, different things that happen. But I believe that God's going to touch you today, each one of you. So open your hearts, open your minds, open your eyes to see what he has for you today. So tell us first off just a little bit about who you are and and, and where you're from and and a little bit about your background of, of... Just briefly, your childhood maybe, and just some of the upbringing hurts and things before we get into. It's not on. How about that? Okay. Yeah, you're good. All right. Uh, Well, that was a lot of questions. Uh, uh, Joanne and I were were raised in North Georgia. actually in Cumming, Georgia, which is a little bit south of Dawsonville. We were, uh, I was raised a Methodist, Joanne was raised a Baptist. We grew up <laughs> about eight miles from each other. What a combination. We went to the, there was only one high school in our county. Uh, I was a couple of years ahead of her, so, I mean, I kind of had my eye on her in high school, but we didn't really know each other, and, uh, but God brought us together uh, and we we got married. I think I was 21. She was 19. And uh, then we had two children, two daughters. And uh, I was saved when I was nine years old, and I never doubted my salvation. I didn't always live like I was saved. I didn't always live in a relationship and a fellowship with Jesus but I was tethered and I stretched that string or that tether several times in our lives but uh, now uh, I'm 60 I'll be 66 next week and one of my regrets in life is that I did not know and have the fellowship with Christ when I was much younger than I that I do now uh, uh, we're traveling all over the country back in October yeah. the Lord told us to sell everything we had a motor home we bought it about five months before that thinking that we were going to take two or three trips a year with our grandkids and uh, but that, that all changed and, and <laughs> uh, we, we were on board with it the Lord, you know, told both of us at the same time. It was it was a mutual uh, awakening for us that we were supposed to sell everything, you know, 98% of everything we owned. And we got an RV and we started traveling. And one of the things he wanted us to do was to visit the churches and the pastors that had visited the North Georgia Revival and where they had brought the fire back and and yeah and to their communities and to their congregations and the lord told us just to come love on them just yeah. to come love on them come on and we didn't really know what that meant and what that would look like but it's been an amazing experience yeah 
I'm going to let Joanne talk about it. <laughs> so thank you guys for your yes, for just jumping in an RV and going all over the world and just meeting people and blessing them with your presence. And listen, they didn't come asking for anything. They just come saying, we're going to serve you however you need us to serve you. Like they were going to clean my gutters out. They were going to do whatever I needed them to do. I mean, I have plenty of cross space things that they could have did. And I said, man, I'm going to put you in a cross space. And they're like, we'll do it. And I, I didn't do that, but I just was teasing them. But they were willing to do it, go in my crawl space with all the spiders and everything else there. And so I'm grateful that they were able to do that. But because he has a haircut like mine, it's kind of hard. Because when you hit your head, it hurts bad when you hit your head on the rafter. So I'm just grateful that they're here with us. And so tell us a little bit about, um, I know that you lost a sister when you... Um, well, when I was a baby, I lost a sister to leukemia. She was yes. five. I didn't know her. But my family was um, totally turned upside down. Even though I was raised in church and went every Sunday, we were playing church. We yeah. were just putting in our hour. And um, I didn't have... Uh, my father was an alcoholic, abusive father. So that we were dysfunctional. And um, my mom ended up having to work two jobs to keep a roof over our heads. So um, the Lord took me back to that early years of life after our tragedy of losing our daughter to show me that um, the enemy had gone all the way back to my childhood to steal my identity, yes. who I was. Yeah. And uh, again, I had the church. I grew up in a local small Baptist church. <clears throat> it was a town that was very small and everybody knew everybody. And I hated my identity because of my father. But I'm healed from that now. Yeah. I had to let so, that go. So was your father an alcoholic before, <clears throat> before your sister had passed away? I feel like uh, there's no one left alive for me to find some of those things out. But I do feel like in my heart that her diagnosis of leukemia yeah. is what drove him to yeah. alcoholism. Mm -hmm. His father was an alcoholic. And alcoholism was in that bloodline uh, which I have yeah. uh, rebuked. <laughs> so you hear what she said all the relatives that she has um, has passed away so she can't get all the solid details on some of this information when she was a child so both of them have lost their parents and um, so they're they've been parentless for, a, for quite a while and a lot of tragedy in their life. We've all experienced a lot of tragedy. I know that I lost a brother um, when he had been drinking and driving accident when he was 16 years old. You know, I lost a nephew that fell off a 10-story parking garage building to his death. And uh, just, just, just suddenly, those instant things that happen that you're not expecting, you know. It's different than sometimes when someone's there, they're in the hospital, and you know that things are going to happen. You just pray for them. But there's suddenlies that happen that just rock your world and shake you. And there's times when those things happen that you just, you just, you get mad at God and you want to be mad at God because you think he could have been the one that prevented this. And, and that's not true though. That's not true at all, is it? Yeah. No. So tell us, um, so I, I want to hear a little bit your story of the moment that you found out about what happened with your daughter. Um. Well, Emily was a single mom. She had two daughters by two different men. And we were always helping her. And this was a Monday morning, and I was scheduled. I, I had in my mind to, to go to her, her house. She just rented a house a few months before and cut the grass and, you know, help her out, whatever. The Saturday before that, I was over there checking the air in her tires and things like that. And she was out in the yard playing with the girls and all that. But I get a phone call on Monday morning. Something told me in my spirit that to put off cutting the grass. And uh, I was out working in the yard. And I get a phone call from my our older daughter. And she said, Dad, you need to go check on Emily. She's been calling people saying some crazy things. So just go over there and check on her. And so I had a friend there helping me do some stuff. And we got jumped in the car and went over there. 
And by the time I got there, when I pulled up in the, her cul-de-sac that she lived in, it was full of emergency vehicles, ambulances, fire trucks, police cars, and there was crime scene tape around the yard. And I just thought, what has she done? You know, uh, I'm not going to get into the story of, of anything, but one of the police officers that I knew met me out in the, on the pavement out in the street and said, you can't go in there. And I said, why can't I go in there? I said, this is my daughter. He said, I mean, he just looked at me with this stare. And I said, why can't I go in there? And he said, well, she didn't make it. I said, what do you mean she didn't make it? And he said, she's gone. And I said, what? He said, she, she committed suicide. And I just couldn't believe it. I just could not believe it. it just, that just blindsided me. But I had been about six months before that. The Holy Spirit had led me to a devotional series called Streams in the Desert. And I had been digging deep into that. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you guys know about the spiritual retreat, I guess it's the best way to go. It. Uh, it's called Walk to Emmaus. There's a similar one called Trace Diaz. There's a uh, Christian Crucio and all. It's a three-day weekend where you go and you just block out the world and you concentrate on Jesus. Well, I'd been very involved in that for a few years and one of the lay directors that I had worked under introduced me to this devotion. And, you know, like I said, I'll take you back. I was in that cul-de-sac and I was just trying to figure out why in the world would she do this? And rage started coming over me. But in that moment, I just felt like Something had dumped a bucket of water over my head, and and I did. The Holy Spirit just calmed me down, and and I heard the words, "You got to get control. You have got to get control. You can't lose control." And uh, then I started thinking about Joanne, and I needed her there. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I tried to call a couple of her friends, couldn't get them, so I just called her. She was at work. And uh, I'd already retired and uh, called her and I, I just told her, I said, you need to come to Emily. Just lock the door where you're at. And she was in, in a uh, model home. And uh, I said, just come up here. Well, she wanted, she wanted details. I said, I can't give you any details. You just got to come up here. And, uh, but uh, she did. And, but she called me about ever. she was probably 15, 20 miles away, and she called me about every three or four miles saying, you got to tell me what, what's going on, what's going on. So finally, when she was just a couple of miles away, she told me where she's at. I said, okay, I'll tell you. I said, you know, Emily took her life this morning, and you just need to get here as quick as you can. Uh, you're in a situation like that, you don't have any idea what to do. You know, you don't have, you know, there's, there's no instruction book for this. So you just got to lean on God. And, and the Holy Spirit had told me to get in control. So that was what I was doing. And then when uh, just a couple of minutes, she pulled up. And I let her tell her uh, what happened then. So you guys can imagine that, that, that anticipation that she was there and, and, and her husband calls and says, you need to get home now. You need to get here now. You need to get here now. You know, we've all had phone calls like that, or I know I have, that you're like, no one, they wouldn't tell you what was going on, but, and then everything in the world runs through your mind at that moment. And so tell us what you, what you were going through in that moment of... of well, you know one minute everything is fine you know you're at work and you're doing what you do and then the next minute your whole world falls apart yeah so when i pulled up and he told me she's gone um i was as far away from the lord then as i could be he never left me 
I still cry. I always say, Lord, you know, let me get through the testimonies and the talks, so, but the tears still come, so I'm just not going to apologize for it. <laughs> Even though it's been seven years, um, that's just how he made me. So I don't know if it's tears of compassion, tears of joy. They're just the tears come, so I'll be using these. But I, I, uh, I heard in my spirit, and I was not used to hearing anything in my spirit at this point, um, because like I said, I was not, um, I love the Lord, I was saved at nine, grew up in church, uh, but I wasn't walking hand in hand with him. I didn't know who I was in Christ. So I heard in my spirit, you will either shake your fist at me or cry out. Now, I forgot a lot of things about that day because that kind of grief, um, you, you, you're in such a fog. And I think a lot of that, the Lord is protecting you from some of that. But that one thing I remember, I will never forget it. I heard you will either shake your fist or cry out for me. And I cried out, I fell to my face and cried out for so long, shouting Jesus that I lost my voice. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's so hard. So those two options that... Two options, and I took, the, I took the cry out. Yeah. Some people don't take that. They take the other option, just to throw their fists at God. Yeah. And, um, and I know we have people in here that have been through the same type of scenario, and they could have chose to just throw their fist up at God and be mad at God and blame Him for all of it. But she chose to, even in a walk that wasn't solid with God, that wasn't living fully for Jesus, knowing all the things that God had for her, that, that He wanted for her, she chose in that moment. And that, that moment, I believe, reading her book and... There's only 14 of them over there, so you guys have to jump on these quick um, before they go, and it's very, very good. But I, I just, I just know that moment was that life-changing moment that changed everything for you. That one choice to either blame God or just glorify God and call out upon His name, and that's what He wants us to do. He wants us to call on His name every time we go through a tragedy. Not blame him, but call out upon him. Ask him for help. Ask him for the freedom in that, in that moment. So, um, so your daughter committed suicide. You know, she had a rough life, different times, you know. And um, she had two daughters. And so, and I know that um, in your book it talks about the, when, when you, you, were, you were there with your other daughter, Je Jessica, I believe, yes. and sh her two children, and they're swimming in the pool, their lives are great, but yet the other daughter had just committed suicide, and two kids from two different dads. You imagine the fight right there from the other parents, the other grandparents, wanting those children because the living dad is still here wanting to take um, charge of their lives. So not only did she get her daughter ripped away from her life, but the two grandchildren were ripped away and then they were separated. So you can imagine what they went through, the heart, what went through their minds is why am I not seeing my grandma anymore? Why is, where's my mom? And then just that suddenly stripped away from everything that they know that's good. And then I know that in your book you went and you were so frustrated seeing Jessica having a great time with the kids yet you were going through this turmoil and still fighting this battle within yourself. So can you explain a little bit about how you got over that hump of that part of your life of the kids being a part and then also how they come back into the, the family? At Jesus, because, yeah. <laughs> because a lot happened in that time. I mean, we, I was filled with anger. I was filled with bitterness. I was filled with hatred to the point that it almost consumed me. Yeah. And, the and word, you wanted to commit suicide yourself? Myself, yes. The enemy wanted to take me out too. And um, I was vulnerable for any of it because I had opened every door to the enemy 
but I didn't know what that was because I didn't have the knowledge of the word. Hosea 4, 6 says, lack of knowledge will destroy you. So I was on the path of destruction myself, same as my daughter had gone on. And um, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit started doing a work because I cried out. He started doing a work in me, but it was a three-year journey. It was almost three years to the month that I felt like I was coming out of that darkness. Yeah. But, and I'm sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> You're good. I, I, I don't even You're know. You, oh, how I dealt with the separation of everything. The separation. Then yeah, the yeah. Back well, there was, there was a lot of, uh, and it's all in the book because I, I won't have time today, but we had a court battle that that we had that we felt like we had to uh, begin to see one of the grandchildren. Uh, one of the parents of the one of the fathers said, you know, there was so much bitterness between him and Emily, and then us. It fell on us after her death that we may not ever see her again, and that was just the work of Satan right there. So I believed it. It was a bait, and I took it, and I believed it, that I would never see her again. So we run out and get an attorney, and it was very nasty. And a court case that was supposed to take three months ended up into 15. And I was crying out. I hadn't seen her in 15 months. And I was crying out again, as I had so many times during that uh, wilderness journey that I called it. I cried out and just said, Jesus, I, I can't do this anymore. Like. It's just been too long, like 15 months. I've trusted you. I've been in the word and you're growing me and I'm seeing things and hearing things I'd never heard before. And I love you and I know you're with me. And uh, he, I heard in my spirit, pick up your Bible. And I did. And it fell open to Psalm 91. And I'd never heard of Psalm 91 the way I know it now. And I started reading it out loud. And I had an, a supernatural encounter where I could hear myself read the scripture. But then... Uh, power came over me, and that's rhema. It's the word, the spoken word. I was reading it out loud, and I, I know now that I was reading it out loud because that's what the Lord wanted me to do. There was nobody else in the house but me, and I normally don't read out loud when I'm by myself. So that was not a coincidence right there. So that power, that rhema was going out, and as I'm reading Psalm 91 out loud, I, s I had a vision. I saw a courtroom in heaven. I didn't even know there was a courtroom at that time. I didn't know anything about the courts of heaven or taking your case to the courts of heaven. I was so innocent in, in the lack of the knowledge. But he was, um, the, I, I, Jesus said to me, it wasn't an open vision, so it's hard for me to articulate it, but he said to me, I am your attorney. And you've been saying you've been trusting me, but you haven't surrendered. And he said, if you'll give this to me, you will have your granddaughter back, and you will receive supernatural. You will receive her back. Yes. Let, well, let, don't let me forget it first. <laughs> These guys do it like we do it. I love it. Let we, me, we, let me we've been all week. I will it's forget fun. it. Just like... <laughs> I will forget it. So anyway, <laughs> I, I, um, the, I saw this. I'm hearing this, and I knew right then that the that we he and I were controlling that with the court case that that if we would surrender even that to him. And I didn't know how he was gonna do that because we had been in this nasty battle for 15 months and I didn't know how. I thought, Lord, you know, you're up there, we're down here. How, how are you gonna fix this? Well, he did. When we, when we surrendered and signed and ended the, the battle, we didn't even know what we agreed to. With 30 days or less, we had her back in our life. Yeah. So you, so you laid not, it all down. I laid altar. it all down, and not yeah. only that, so I was using both wings. We, I call it in my book the wing of trust and the wing of surrender. You have to use both wings to fly. You can't fly if you have a broken wing. So I had a broken wing. And, but Andy was, you know, doing everything I wanted to do. He knew in his heart, he felt the whole time that we, did, we shouldn't be doing this. But he's like, you don't mess with Mama Bear. And he knew that I was in such grief, he knew not to argue with me. So, but we ended it, and, now, and I felt love for the Father. See, that's the key right there. There was so much anger, and when that encounter happened, and that, that, whole, that baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon me, that's what happened. I didn't know it then, but I, later I knew that that was what it was. Yeah. Um, I was washed. 
that I felt love for that father and I started praying for him. So now the Lord could work on our behalf and his heart was softened and our granddaughter was brought back to our life. Yeah. But as long as we had that uh -huh. anger and bitterness, uh, Ephesians tells us, he warns us, don't do this. And he may, his word is true, but I had to go through this darkness and this journey to be Holy Ghost taught to see that it almost destroyed me. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but I knew if I didn't, I would forget. So you needed to lay that down in order yeah. for the Lord to answer the call that you had for that situation. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that you guys need to understand, first of all, the Holy Spirit asked me, how many people in the room are familiar with Psalm 91? Okay, yeah. that's good. I mean, because it's about half of you. Everybody in this room needs to study Psalm 91. Yes, you need you need great. to repeat it every day until and I can't quote it, but I know exactly what it says. I know exactly what the Lord will do for me because of what's said in Psalm 91, yeah. and and it talks about being in the secret place. You need to find the secret place of the Lord, Amen. and once you find that secret place, you have all power and authority over yes. over the enemy, yeah. and this encounter that Joanne had when the Lord told her that you know he was the ultimate judge and he was the ultimate attorney and all that this was about two and a half years before the North Georgia revival broke out we weren't going to Christ Fellowship then we had never heard anything about the baptisms and, and the miracles that was happening in, but Joanne was in her bathtub in the water when all of this happened yeah. so God st started using the water in our life a long time before yes. we found out about, yeah. about and I just want you to know the significance yeah. of what yeah. the Lord is doing with yeah. water and uh, uh, one of the things that, that you probably are asking and you'll find it out if you buy and read the book is that both of the dads, right before Emily committed suicide and Emily passed away, both of the dads had teamed up and decided to try to prove her as an unfit mother. And and uh, when Emily died, they they tried to, you know, they were taking her to court trying to take the kids away from her. But the minute that Emily passed away, that gave them the legal right to have the kids so before the sun set that day, those two dads came and took our grandkids away from us. Yeah. And one of them said, you'll never see her again. Yeah. And, that's, and, and I knew that in the state of Georgia, we had legal right to see our grandkids. Yeah. And that's where our, our battle in the state court ensued. And I thought I was doing the right thing because I had a friend that was a an amazing Christian and an attorney. So I hired him thinking that I was doing right. But but God sent us yeah. a, uh, well, I mean, like I said, it went on 15 months and, and we'd get into court and we'd think, well, this is the day. And the judge would say, no, I'll go back to arbitration again or, or I'm not ready to hear that. Or, you need to go into this conference room and y'all need to work it out and the attorneys would run back and forth, and it was just crazy, the things that we had to deal with. But when Joanne humbled her heart and, and was in the water and, and crying out to, to God, he gave her the revelation. Yeah. And I'd already felt it about three or four months before that we needed to just walk away and, and, and let God do what God does. And, uh, but, you know, like she said, I wasn't going to fight Mama Bear. And, and that, was not a, that, that was not a battle that I was wanting to work out right now, but God fixed it. He fixed it. When, when, yeah. when we submitted it to him, he fixed it. Yeah, so we're going to, um, we're, for the sake of time, we're going to, I want you guys to grab this book, and if you don't get it today, if we don't, there's, she didn't have enough with her. The, okay, she's got 20 on. extra yeah. out in the vehicle, but they're going to some other places that they need to have a few with them. So you can order this book if you if you don't get it today on Amazon. Let them know. Yeah, and we'll get Amazon. that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, so we'll get that information to okay. them um, on Amazon to order it. So, 
how did you get into the painting? Because I know that's a big part of your healing is the painting. Was you an artist before? I painted as a kid and I, it, it, no one in our family, so my mom says, ever drew or sketched or anything. And she was always amazed, like, where did you get that? And at that time, I didn't even know about gifts from God. I just yeah. said, well, I was always looking for someone that it was in, you know, that I inherited it from. Never could find anyone that could even, you know, draw a straight line. So it was just a gift, and I painted as a kid, and I know that it would be, like, my, because of the pain in my childhood, the paintings would would heal me somehow. Yeah. Like, yeah. I would, I'd love to paint it. I kind of, like, hid hid myself in art. But then as I started growing up and going to college, you know, going to school, I didn't go to college, going to high school, the world tells you you got to get a real job. I wanted so bad, I felt it, that my art was key. Yeah. But I just kept hearing this voice, you'll be a starving artist, you know. So I just laid the art down. Yeah. And in the tragedy, six months after Emily's death, I... As, you know, started having these visions that as a Baptist girl I'd never had before. And one was the painting there. I had this vision of Christ carrying me. And I am, it was six months into the grief, and the grief was horrific. And I saw, I'm, it's like I'm standing back looking at that. That's me looking at me, Christ carrying me. And it was a storm, it was a valley. Now, what I did not see was the light. Not at all. I saw Christ carrying me through total darkness. So I'm trying to paint this. I felt in my spirit I was supposed to paint it, and I hadn't painted in forever. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And even when I painted, I didn't paint people. Like that. I painted flowers and stuff like that. So I thought, how in the world am I going to paint this? Because I didn't even know how to paint a body form or anything. So I start painting this. And then all of a sudden, I'm picking up my brush and I'm putting all those streaks of white in there. And every time I did it, I said, why are you doing that? Like, I was mad at myself. You hear what she's saying? She was painting dark. She was trying to paint was, darkness. And I couldn't. But God would not let her paint darkness. He kept yeah. making her do strips you of, do stroke, of light. And, I was so, <laughs> and I'm like, why are you doing this? Why? Like, what's, what's going on? I almost threw it away. And I thought, and I was shaking my head. I'll never forget it. Walking through the house. Like, what are you going to do with this? Like, it's, why don't you just trash it and do it again? Because that is not what you saw. I did not see that light. So several months later, I'm praying, I'm crying out. I was crying out all the time. <laughs> and I was praying and I, I wasn't even looking at that. I had propped it in that bathroom on that windowsill where I spent half my life at that time. See, I was drawn to the water, and I can't believe I'm talking about it because I would always say my prayer room. I didn't, see, that's the enemy right there. He doesn't want me to say I was in my bathtub in the water. Yeah. There was power in that water, yeah, and that was where I, I had, we've seen uh, yeah. it. Yes, we've seen it. I thought, I don't, you know, I don't For want sure. them, to, I just thought, you know, I don't want them to think my bathroom's my power. Why not? Because that's where the Lord met me, was in that garden tub. And I, I, I was shriveling up like a prune. I spent so many hours in there. But I'm, in, I'm in, this, in, this, in the tub, and I had that propped up, and I, I hadn't looked at it forever. You know, I just didn't even look at it anymore. And I was praying, and I said, Lord, I know one day I'm going to see the light. I know one day I won't die. And I opened my eyes, and it landed on that light. And I was like, and I'm still not knowing like I didn't grow up in a spirit-filled church I didn't grow up knowing the power of God I, I we got you saved we did a real good job of that but it it kind of ended there or the you know the messages I heard I'm not downing please hear me I'm not I'm thankful for my Baptist background yeah. <laughs> but I did know that I had power and authority. I didn't know who I was. So I saw that light and I, we had, Andy and I had one friend that was ministering to us and she was spirit filled and we thought she was crazy. Like she would come and minister to us and she would talk about things and we're like, what, what, what is she talking about? And when she would leave, we'd go, you know, you know. <laughs> so I called her. I thought, well, if anybody knows what's going on with this, she will. <laughs> And I called her. I said, Terry, I said, what? I said, I've just had this crazy something happen. Explain that. She starts laughing. She said, 
that's prophetic art. Well, I'd never heard that as a Baptist girl. I said, what do you mean? I'm not a prophet. What are you talking about? I don't understand. Anyway, she starts explaining prophetic art to me. Whole new world opened up. They didn't even know what it was. So I, bottom line, that's my first prophetic painting. <laughs> didn't know what it was. Almost threw it away. So what I want you to know is that I cried out. Amen. And he heard. And it was the posture of my heart. Yeah. Yeah. And he never left me. Yeah. Never. So that started the painting, the prophetic painting, but I still didn't know it. I didn't know the prophetic art was coming. And it was spoken over me several times. Then we found Christ Fellowship. The Lord led us there. It was... It was meant to be uh, the prophetic painting on stage happened. That's too long of a story to get into today. But it was spoken over me several times, and it just went right over my head because I didn't understand it. And then a final prophetic word over me that I would be painting prophetically. And I so didn't understand it. I was terrified, and I had to Google. I had to go home and Google it. What is prophetic painting on stage during worship and praise? Like, I don't understand this. And I stepped into it full of fear, yeah. Yeah. but wanted so badly to be obedient because yes. our disobedience or my disobedience hadn't worked. Yeah. Yes. And it caused a lot of yes. pain and heartache. I want to chime in real quick. I think it's awesome that your first painting is about his light and glory because that is so what heals our souls and the grief stricken soul of you guys what you experienced um and just the trauma it's it's jesus's light and glory that brings healing to those areas um so i think it's amazing that through your journey it's from his light and glory that has brought you to where you're at and her prophetic art her and tammy both they have very similar paintings at times um, yeah. It has been amazing. The first time we walked into Christ Fellowship, um, her art is displayed on a long hallway wall. And I called Tammy. I think I called and I was like, Tammy, you're going to believe this. I'm seeing so many similarities on this wall of what you have painted. And um, it, it's just, I love just how God works and the healing that has brought you just from your obedience of painting. And um, so many... Uh, times her artwork, just as Tammy's, has touched people. You know, how many here that we know, Tammy, that have ran up and had to buy that painting because it meant something just for them. She's had the same thing. And um, God is so amazing at how he draws out your gifts to bring healing to you and to others yes. just from your obedience. Yes, and I had cried out one of the things I... You know, I, I was begging God for this when Emily died. I didn't want, I didn't know how it was going to end up, but I, I begged him to not let her death be wasted. Yeah. And I knew something was going to come from it because on the day of her celebration of life service, I had a vision. That was my first vision. It was seven days after her death. I saw myself on a raised platform and it was dark. I couldn't see what I was doing. I didn't know why I was on the platform. It was very quick and I saw all I knew was that thousands of people, maybe thousands, but a lot of people were watching whatever it was that I was doing. Yeah. And I didn't know, you know, I had no idea what that was going to be. Yeah. And so one night at Christ Fellowship during revival when I was painting on stage, the Lord took me back to that vision and he said, yeah, this is it. the whole world is watching. <laughs> and not necessarily so watching me paint, but you know, I was part of the revival and the Lord took Andy and I there and Kaneo the revival, the revival fire. We were drawn to that, and we are so thankful that the Lord has used this tragedy, this grief. And I know that if He can take a broken, 
girl from a local Baptist church that had no idea. I had no idea. I didn't know that angels were warriors. I didn't know that, uh, that Pentecost, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know that uh, the power of Pentecost. I didn't know about the power of praying in tongues. I didn't know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know about that I was to carry out the Great Commission, that, you know, we are empowered to uh, do all the same things that the Lord uh, commissioned the uh, apostles and the disciples to do. In, in my upbringing, it was, it died with them. It died with, uh, it was like, it's just a, no, a good history book. And that whatever was dealt me, whatever came my way here on earth, God did it. And I do, I want to add this before we close. If we're about to do that, I don't know. Yeah. I do want to say this, the importance of knowing the word. Don't fall in the trap that I fell in. I don't know where you go. I, I, I definitely trust this house, but I don't know what house you, you, you go to. But... I listened for 50 some odd years. I was probably 57 when Emily took her life, give or take. But saved at nine. So however many of those years were, I listened to what the preacher said for 30 minutes and I went home and that was it. I never got into the word for myself. So lack of knowledge, if you don't know the full word and you're not in the word, it, it can destroy you because you don't know how to fight the enemy. Yes. And if you are not, if you're hearing wrongful word for all my life, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says that temptation, that the Lord will not allow temptation to overtake you. He will give you an out. I heard that growing up as God will not put more on you than you can bear. That is not what it says. God does not tempt you. Satan is the tempter. That scripture is saying that he will not allow the tempter to tempt you more than you can bear because he will give you an escape. Yes. I never heard that part. Here is from the pulpit, from my parents, from my grandparents. I heard all my life, God will not put more on you than you can bear. I blamed God for everything. And I have repented for that. Yeah. Jesus, thank you. He is good. He is Always. nothing but good. Always. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. You know, in our travels and when we left and were obedient, and that's one of the things that I want to emphasize is when you hear God and you know, and you know it's God and He asks you to do something, do, do it. Do it. He's, he's not going to put you in a situation to embarrass you. He's not going to put you in a situation to take anything away from you. I mean, if you've got a bad habit or something like that, he'll take that away from you. But if, if he's only good, he can only be good. He can't lie. He, he's, he's only true. He is the definition of truth. Yeah. And uh, when, when we came on the road, the, the main thing that, that I feel like our mission is, is to let people know how good he is. Yes, come on. How good he is. Uh, uh, he's been he's blessed me and Joanne all of our lives uh, before we were together and since we were together he's blessed us and blessed us but since we said yes and this is amazing that you know when we first start getting to know Pastor Jason and Pastor Shelley you know their theme is yes you know but when we first said yes, the blessings have just multiplied. Mm -hmm. It's multi you would not believe, you know, of some of the stuff that we've seen, some of the people we've got to minister to, and all of this. Uh, uh, you know, some people look at what we're doing and they think we're just on a long, expensive, extended vacation, but we're not. You know, we are. We're kind of like Johnny Appleseed. Uh, we're out here planting seeds and telling people how good God is. And, and the Holy Spirit told me one day, I mean, we were sitting in our RV talking one evening not too long ago. And, and they said, you know, we, we looked at 
she said something and I said something and then we, we looked at this and said, are we really doing what the Lord wants us to do? And immediately the Holy Spirit said, you're out here planting seeds. And that's all I'm asking you to do is plant the seed. Yes. Somebody else will water them and somebody else will, will, will reap the fruit. But you're out here planting seeds. And then on top of that, we get sometimes to sit and tell people how good he is and, and how if you're obedient and how you listen to him, he will bring you through this grief. Grief is of the devil. Jesus, just like that painting right there, Jesus is, is, is one step behind you. And all you got to do is turn around and, and grab hold of him. When, when Joanne came into that cul-de-sac, when the day our daughter passed away, she hit her knees. And, and I'd seen it. I had seen her relationship with Jesus, her fellowship with Jesus wane and, and fade away. But, you know, it scared me because I knew that this would be a turning point. But, but I saw her hit her knees and cry out to him. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I knew it would be okay. Uh, it took a while. You know, we still have pain. We miss our daughter every day. Yeah. But we know I saw her give her life to Christ. I saw her go through the youth, walk to Emmaus, the chrysalis, and I saw her recommit herself a couple of times to the Lord. So I have no doubt where she's at today. And I would not ask her to come back into this world and live the life she lived for anything, you know. But I have peace and comfort knowing that we can come out here and we can tell people he's right there ready to grab hold of you and yeah. tote you through this storm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amen. Well, let's stand. Let's give him a, uh, just a thank you for your yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. You guys can stay here a minute. So listen, I know you guys, I know all of us have been through things, been through trauma, tragedies, things in our life that we need to overcome, that we need to break off in our life. And I know this was a different service, different kind of an atmosphere, but I feel like the Lord wants to move in any atmosphere that we put him first in. That's what he's going to do. So we're grateful for that. So just bow your heads right now. We turn the ambient music up and just bow your heads. And Father, we just thank you right now. Father, you know the hurt in this room. Father, you know that the fists that have been shaken at you, Lord, and the knees that have bowed down and gave you it all. And Father, we're asking right now that you would search each heart. If there's anything left in the heart, Lord, that needs healing from anything that, that they've been through, Father, any trauma, any trial, tribulation that they've been through. Father, no matter whether it was a young kid or, Lord, even yesterday, that God, you would bring them to the altar, Lord, and bring them to their knees to worship you, to give it all to you, to cry out to you, to lay it down once and for all to you and trust you with it, God, that knowing that you're going to bless them in that by giving it all to you, you're going to give back everything that you desire for them to have back. So we glorify you for that right now. We honor you. We trust you, Lord, how you're going to move in this place. We thank you for tonight, God, and what you're going to do in the water tonight, the healing that's going to happen, Lord. We've seen it week in and week out, Lord. We've seen it in Dawsonville. We've seen it every place that we've gotten to travel over the United States, Lord. We've seen it in this house, healing after healing, after healing. Father, you're opening the door for healing every week for hearts to be transformed, lives to be changed. So Father, we're thanking you right now and we just open up the altars. Come and pray. Come and pray and let Jesus heal your heart. Let him take away every burden, every bit of pain and turn it to joy. Turn it to joy. This couple is not living in sorrow anymore. They're living in joy. And the overflow of joy in their life is what's overflowing into other people's lives. It's not the sorrow. It's the joy. It's where they came from and where they are today. And that's what God is doing. So come and pray. Come and pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your people. Open their hearts right now, Lord. Let them see. Let them come and worship you right now. And pray to you, God for healing in their hearts. In Jesus' name, come and pray.
Come and pray.